Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Stowell. I work for um, on a red team for a large financial firm, and uh, I'm here to introduce uh, David Scrillo. He has a um, an awesome talk uh, planned for um, the challenges faced when uh, kind of auditing and testing Internet of Things, uh, which is a hot topic today. Uh, and he's taken a pen tester's mindset and kind of applying it to um, the Internet of Things and. Uh, he has an awesome giveaway where he's going to um, teach you how to um, set up a kind of a toolkit for testing all of these, these things uh, uh, for what under a hundred? Under a hundred. Yeah, yeah. So without further ado, uh, Charles Grillo. Thank you. All right. So good. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. I won't try to keep everyone too long before lunch. But uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm a pen tester, uh, information security consultant. And so the talk and the kind of the premise of this talk is my introduction and wor working through the IoT space from the pen testers point of view. Um, so outside of pen testing, I'm a professor here at Drexel University. Uh, I teach courses in digital forensics, computer forensics, uh, cybersecurity, etc. Um, also a member and one of the uh, leaders of Philadelphia Security Shell. So that's a local uh, community here that we do a lot of uh, training and hands-on workshops. Uh, we've partnered with Drexel, so a lot of our meetings are here. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can find me after the talk. Um, outside of all the uh, computer and work, I'm very involved in hockey. I'm part of the Team USA development program for inline hockey, so I coach and have played on the women's uh, national team. I coach and have played on the men's national team. So that's a little bit about me. So what's the agenda for today? We're going to talk about the risk of IoT. We all know that there is a risk. Um, and when taking the, the pen testers approach, I was very much you know, looking for either a framework or some sort of baseline to be able to audit these devices. So we're going to take a look at the OWASP Internet of Things top 10. Uh, we're going to define that as what we call our IoT attack surface. So within this Internet of Things, what are all the different ways and avenues that we can get access to these devices? Um, one of the biggest learning curves and challenges as I moved into testing IoT tools was the software-defined radio and, and the new wireless spectrums that are being used from Zigbee and Z-Wave, etc. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about IoT and physical security. Uh, and then, more importantly, we'll talk about what to put on your machine from a testing perspective, uh, some of the tools that I came across in my research uh, that are new to me and that I'm still learning but are very useful in the IoT space. And then again, as mentioned, you know, how to get started within this space for under 100 bucks, and then we'll open the floor for uh, some Q&A. So I run a cybersecurity practice. My practice uses the NIST cybersecurity framework for most of our audits. So one of the first thing I did in venturing into the IoT space was what does NIST have to say about it? Um, we know that there's a risk because of the lightweight encryption. Because these devices are so small, they can only compute to such a strength, and that's the, where we're at from an encryption standpoint. Where does cybersecurity stand on the physical system? So again, the initial purpose of the NIST cybersecurity framework was for our critical infrastructure. Um, one of my biggest concerns and one of the reasons I started researching this space is my wife's diabetic. My wife wears an insulin pump, and they mailed us one that was Bluetooth with the smartphone, and we just shipped it back. I know we're not there yet from an IoT space. Um, I'm interested in how we can make these devices more secure. Um, RFID is kind of what's old is new, so even RFID technology is being integrated into IO things. Even things like farms and managing cattle is now an Internet of Things issue because we're putting chips in animals to be able to track them. So what's the security of that? Um, and then again, our industrial systems and the cloud. So that's NIST's perspective of the IoT risk. So what's the OWASP IoT Top 10? What's it considered? Again, very similar to the web application project. It's a checklist of what to look at when you're auditing an IoT device. So what's its web interface? From a web interface perspective, just go reference the OWASP Top 10 web for open access points and then dump that traffic, I'm going to get whatever you're doing when you're setting up that IoT device. So that's back to someone with a backpack just patrolling the neighborhood, being able to watch anyone in the neighborhood register their IoT devices. And the screenshot is simply it. This was me taking a smart light switch 
and connecting it to my home network. And again, this was a simple JSON request that the outlet was then pushing to the mobile app to allow the mobile app to do that synchronization and bring this smart switch onto my Wi-Fi network. Um, big privacy advocate, as most people in this room are, so what are these devices collecting? Where are they storing it? How is it shipping it out? There's some of the things you want to look at when you know testing in the IoT space. Um, insecure cloud interfaces. So there was a really interesting uh, talk at DEF CON 24 when I attended. Uh, it's called Backdooring the Front Door, if anyone's interested in checking it out. But what the research showed is that we can take all the requests for these smart devices, especially locks, and they're held server side. So if we send the unlock command as the admin, the door will open. So intercepting these mobile device communications through tools like man in the middle proxy, et cetera, and looking at is this API talking purely server side, you can simply just send whatever command you want if you have the right information um, and get the lock to open. Where's the real risk in that? I see a lot of Airbnb, and I see a lot of people using these devices to allow one person some one-time entry into their home and not really taken into consideration that person could come back a month, year later, and again, they have that unique identifier of the lock, and they're just changing the server-side request from guest to admin, and then they're able to unlock the door. So it was a very interesting talk. Um, back to the mobile interface. So more creds in the clear, depending on how this mobile device communicates with the application. Um, and then what's the account lockout? So does the IoT device do any sort of account lockout or can we just try any sort of password combination until we get in? Um, insufficient security configurability. What that basically means is because these devices are so small and meant for mesh networking, etc., they don't store a lot of logs. There's no forensic analysis of what happened within this IoT device if it's the point of compromise. So back to the privacy, what does this device actually store? What information can we use from a um, monitoring and logging standpoint? Uh, insecure firmware and software. So how does this IoT device upgrade of its firmware. Some manufacturers are getting better and can encrypt the firmware on download, but again, if you're in the middle of the application, sometimes it's not even encrypted, it's set in the clear. And we'll walk through with a small demo, you know, what to do with that firmware and how you can start, you know, reverse engineering what's actually on this IoT device. Um, and then with direct physical access, you can always have compromise. So in the IoT space and kind of my 2018 objective is to get much more involved in the physical IoT implementation. So looking at things like JTAG ports and the USB and being able to actually extract the firmware directly from the hardware is something I'm very interested in, you know, learning a lot more about. So with IoT comes a lot of wireless communication. So one of the first systems I looked at, um, and it, it had very much to do with what I was doing at the time, I was implementing access control systems. So these were systems that used a lot of RFID. Um, so oh, that's a typo. That should be a lot brighter. But RFID, low frequency, is going to use between 125 and 135 megahertz. But again, this is basically our key fob systems to get into the building. Um, so I looked at this from a cybersecurity perspective. And what we looked at in taking a look at the access control architectures, it follows all the different systems have a very generic format. There's the door readers in and out, the request for exits, et cetera. These are our nodes. They ultimately all get wired back to a central TCP IP device, something that it can actually get Ethernet, and then the rest of the translation goes to the app. Front end, usually sometimes it's a desktop client. Most of the ones we looked at were web interfaces. So with a web interface, what's the first thing you want to look at is the API. Um, the company that we tested actually had a very cool solution to actually find all the nodes on the network. So they had a free tool. It was meant for the engineers, but in the pen test, you can just download the tool and now find the central hub that's going to be all this analog to TCP IP translation. What we noticed in discovering this panel is, again, back to those hard-coded credentials and just the lack of complexity in the IoT space, is the API had a hard-coded command or uh, username and password, so you could interact with it. So what can we do with the API that we're going to interact with? We can pull down every card that's in the system. So now we have every user ID from a key fob standpoint and what levels of access they have access to. And the access levels are very interesting because we have the employee access, all doors, office access. Um, and basically, and looking through this dump, you're able to then create your own card because you're going to want all doors, uh, access always, and the one that got us in the door was the fact that we were able to disable the alarm. So we made our key part of the, um, you know, shutting off the alarm system within the access control unit. So when we presented the key at the, the client site, 
The door opened, we disabled the alarm, none of the cops were called, etc. And it was a valid key within the system. So if you're familiar with access control, there's something called a door contact. So even if we were to pick the lock and they had the right alert set up that that door contact opened without an official authentication, there could have been an alert or something that at least alluded that we were entering the building. Uh, from a camera standpoint, um, we basically were able to just grab the pictures of the cameras in real time, very James Bondish, and then again, be able to see the front door as we approached it to make sure that everyone had left the building. Uh, locating cameras, simple NMAP scan for 554 is going to be a lot of the ports they use in operating, but um, Shodan is going to be a phenomenal resource, especially when people think that their IP camera systems are hidden. Uh, they're basically just under the assumption because you don't know their IP, you're not going to find them. So they're very easy to locate within uh, Shodan. And that was kind of phase one of my exposure to IoT. And when, what kind of came out of that was you know, what I call IoT version two, which was all sensor network based. So still at that point in my research and study, it was still everything was TCP IP related. So we were looking at APIs and nodes and everything had an IP address and could be scanned. Uh, when you look at things like Zigbee and Z-Wave though, they kind of lose that touch. So I was very confused when I first started venturing in to what is you know, the IoT sensor networks and what are all these smart devices. And again, within IoT, the biggest phrase that I hear is what's old is new. So I had to go back and actually learn about digital to analog communication. So this is very simply how we're going to send stuff we're going to talk about capturing with a software-defined radio from system to system. And how we encode that information is done one of three ways. It can be done via the amplitude of the signal, so we can go up or down within the frequency channel, um, and then also the frequency, so the repetitive nature of that signal, and then again the phase. The phase is the difference between the sine and the cosine, so let's imagine a wireless wave, and then the second time around it doesn't go that low, and then around, so that's going to be phase. Um, again, in implementing or um, executing one of those, you're going to be able to get to the zeros and ones of this signal, and we'll walk through what that looks like from an IoT perspective. Um, and one of the interesting things that's kind of missing from the TCP IP spec that, uh, that's very important in the IoT space is what's called a preamble. So all these devices are meant, and they're always listening, so they're always looking for that beacon or that request. Very small amounts of data are sent between these devices. So they have to set up their communication channel. So there's an initial preamble that says, hey, I'm about to speak, and then there's the acknowledgement, and then there's the actual data that gets passed to the IoT device. And from a graphics perspective, this is really what we're dealing with. We have the zeros and ones that then modulate it into that signal. Then we can demodulate and get back to the zeros and ones. A lot of advancement in testing the IoT has gone a long way since the software-defined radio. Um, having the ability to do a lot of this computation computer side versus hardware side was a big um, advancement from a research standpoint. So again, one thing I just wanted to bring out, and I came across it a bunch of times in my readings, is the difference between analog modulation and digital. So when you're talking digital modulation, you'll hear things such as key shifting, and then within the analog space, it's simply just modulation. So whenever you're talking digital modulation, you'll hear things like amplitude, frequency, again, key, uh, shift keying, excuse me. So within digital modulation, what are the different ways we can send these zeros and ones that we're going to talk about from an IoT perspective? Again, we mentioned amplitude, frequency, and phase. Um, I'm going to butcher this, but offset, quadrature, phase, shift, king. Got it that time. That was a, that was a tough one this week. Um, but that's going to be used in uh, Z-Wave and Zigbee. And again, that's a combination of amplitude and phase, uh, shift, king. Excuse me. So again, from a visual inspection, because I've been talking a lot, this is what we're talking about when we look at digital data, what's amplitude shift king, again the frequency, and then the phase changing. So one of the first protocols I took a look at was Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, uses frequency hopping across the spectrum. This allows it to operate at various different channels and send data at different channels. Um, it operates again in the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. Um, if you're familiar with the Ubertooth One, which we'll discuss in a little bit, that's going to be a device that will allow you to capture this traffic and have some analytics um, on the data. Uh, for reference point, the Ubertooth is not a Bluetooth dongle, so it cannot do Bluetooth functions. It's completely meant for sniffing. You still will need to utilize an onboard Bluetooth card in conjunction with it. If you don't have one, depending if it's a Raspberry Pi, etc., you can have a little extender to get that onboard USB uh, Bluetooth function. When you're advertising in the Bluetooth space to actually get connectivity to a device, you use certain channels, so 37, 38, and 39, 
That's when you're advertising, looking for that connection. So from a sniffing standpoint, if you're looking for a device that's constantly beaconing, those would be the channels you want to take a look at. Um, again, in the maroon, we have our regular wireless channels, and then everything else is going to be what the Bluetooth low energy spectrum operates on. So what's in this packet? What's, what's actually under the hood of Bluetooth low energy? Um, we have what's known as the local link control and adaptive layer protocol and basically this is a protocol that allows it to hop those channels and use, do that frequency spectrum hopping that was in the previous slide and know what channel, what data was set on, etc. As far as knowing who they're communicating to, we have the access address. So within that information, even though we're hopping on various channels and communicating, that address is ultimately going to be our destination, etc. Um, and then there's the initial payload and then we have our message integrity check like most physical layers. Um, one of the most interesting protocols I came across, because again it's very new, is Z-Wave. Um, so this is used a lot in home automation. So when we look at the Samsung smart home, etc., a lot of these devices are using what's known as Z-Wave protocols. From a physical perspective and actually sniffing the traffic, uh, it's going to be at 908.42 or 9.16. So they're going to be the frequencies that you're going to look at when taking a look at Z-Wave. Um, and mesh networking is something that's very important when you look at IoT versus traditional communication. All these devices are meant to be able to be fail over and find multiple routes. Um, so abusing that from a pen tester uh, viewpoint, can we get these devices to jump off their network and now join mine? Um, so what's that look like? So again, what's a closer look at Z-Wave? What's actually under the hood? Um, Home and source ID, again, because you're going to be routing through multiple machines um, in a mesh network, you're going to need your home and source. Um, and then basically, again, if you look at the physical frame, we have the preamble, which we discussed earlier. And then there's a frame control, again, to specify, because we're using very small amounts of data, we have to control how much is in there. And then we actually have our destination ID. So home and source is going to be the first hop. So source is the device. Home is going to be that next hop in the network, and then ultimately our destination is going to be mostly the hub. So if you look at Samsung Smart Home, all the Z-Wave sensors are meant for your doors and your locks in motion, and then the hub does that TCP to Z-Wave translation where that device can listen on that frequency and then also communicate out to the cloud and talk to your Samsung app that tells you whether or not your smart device is working or not. Um, within the application frame of Z-Wave, it's very interesting, we have what's known as the command class and then the command, and then the parameter. So let's look at the light bulb, for example. The command class could be global config of lights. All right, so that's within the command um, what we're actually going to touch, the light. Uh, the command itself could be change the color, if we're looking at, for example, a Philips Hue. And then the parameter would be simply what color we're going to change that to. So in analyzing these packets, you know, change the colors of the lights, and now you have a quick way of knowing, all right, here's the preamble, here's the sync, here's the data. And I know the data is different because this part of the binary and the actual raw signal that we're capturing, that must be what's the light switch, or must be the color. Etc. And that's part of the reverse engineering that we'll discuss. Um, again, mentioned Zigbee a bunch of times. It's going to operate within the same spectrum as Bluetooth, that 2.4 ISM band. Um, it uses carrier sense, multi-access, collision avoidance. And that's very interesting in my research because a lot of these networks are jammable. So because, if anyone's unfamiliar with uh, that term, basically when you're waiting to talk on the wireless channel, you listen first. And you ask the question, is anyone else talking before I, I jump in and start communicating? Well, if Zigbee uses that, there's been a lot of research in simply just jamming that channel. What does that do from the IoT and the automation from a security standpoint? If that device can't send the acknowledgement back to the hub that the window's been open, et cetera, uh, what does that look like? Again, very low latency. We're not sending a lot of information uh, through this network. And then this is a good uh, visual representation of anyone who's unfamiliar with the difference between, again, star cluster tree and mesh. Your traditional computer networks are going to be either star or cluster tree, and then mesh is really the uniqueness of IoT because all these devices, again, meant to fail over and be able to communicate through each other. Um, so they're very interesting. So again, within the Zigbee packet, again, just like the Z-Wave, same structure format. We're going to have that preamble, we're going to have the this, this sync, 
the data frame, and then the close of the connection. What's in the data frame? Uh, Zigbee can have a little bit more security control, so there is some lightweight encryption within Zigbee. Um, destination and source, just like within uh, the Z-Wave, is going to be the same concept. We're going to be able to route through devices, so we need to know what's our first hop and ultimately what's our end goal. Um, and then there's actually the data payload and then the checksum at the end. Uh, another interesting part about the Zigbee protocol is because we're doing, again, mesh network, we're doing device to device and then throughout the rest of the topology, it will share uh, a network key with everyone. So depending on how your IoT device distributes that network key, that could be a vulnerability. Uh, is it hard-coded into every Zigbee device or every uh, version of that device from a manufacturing standpoint? There's been a lot of research and that's the case. And so if you capture one of these network keys, you can go around and decrypt any of the other clients or home users, etc. And then there's what's known as the link key. So the link key is going to be from me to you, but then we also have a network key to encrypt our communication across the whole Zigbee network. Um, it operates, again, within the 2.4 ISM band and operates on channels uh, 11 through 26, so 16 channels total. Um, in Europe, it uses a different uh, frequency channel. So some of the tools of the trade, some of the, the tools I came across in doing IoT research that, again, I didn't use as a traditional pen tester. When you look at an IoT device, I started in the camera space, so I could scan the camera. I could use Nikto to enumerate the, the, uh, the web, etc. but I didn't know much about um, some of the other tools. So what was my setup in conducting my research? Um, went out and a big proponent of System76, they make Linux-based laptops. Um, Little pricey, but again, some great hardware. Um, from an OS standpoint, being a pen tester, I stuck with Kali. Um, so again, and if anyone that's uh, unfamiliar, you can get everything that Kali has to offer with that first command. Uh, so Kali packages all their tools. There's a, a, cer a certain rep uh, repo for just forensic suites or just GPU for cracking. If you do the Kali Linux all, you're going to get uh, everything for SDR, everything for the Ubertooth, all your tools kind of within one install. Uh, there's then tools that we're going to add to that. Um, one of the first ones that I came across later in my research that I, I fell in love with is called the Universal Radio Hacker. So in first identifying these signals, um, I was doing what most people were doing at the time, and Hack5 has videos on it, but you'd capture the, the raw wave with the SDR, and then you would go into Audacity and really stretch the file out in, in real you know, wave format, look at the frequencies. So this Universal Radio Hacker is a very slick tool that can do a lot of that computation for you and helps you organize your IoT research. Um, Blue Hydra is another great tool for using uh, in conjunction with the Ubertooth. Uh, Binwalks for analyzing firmware. Fermidine takes that a step further and actually creates databases, and we'll discuss that. And then uh, APK tool is going to be for uh, reverse engineering Android applications. Uh, from a hardware standpoint, I had a HackRF, um, Yardstick one, Ubertooth one, a uh, Proxmart, uh, that's for RFID cloning, and then a very small uh, Arduino Nano for some of the other IoT stuff. Uh, miscellaneous, and the most important part, is a patient wife if you're married because I come home from work after working a full day and then there's another four hours of I'm really trying to figure out what Z-Wave is, I'm not going to come up for dinner and I'll put the kids to bed. And my wife's amazing, she's very supportive, so I'm able to conduct a lot of my research after hours. So first tool, Binwalk. Uh, when you get a binary file, whether it's from a web download, sometimes you can go directly to the, the website and download the latest firmware and then you're flashing it yourself. Um, so directly from the web you can get it. Um, at a hardware level, you could extract it, you could intercept it. So either way, we're making the assumption that you've gotten a hold of some firmware or bin file. Uh, this tool is going to allow you to analyze what file system's on the bin. Um, it's going to extract it, etc. Very useful. Again, uh, Fermidine, very useful tool. And one of the things I didn't touch on in describing it, and it's, it's really its main purpose, is it can emulate the firmware. So without needing to flash this binary file to an actual piece of hardware to really see what it's about, you can emulate it directly within Fermidine and then actually um, emulate the RAM too. So if you're looking for buffer overflows, etc., you can do direct memory access and really see what you're doing to the IoT device. Um, it stores everything in a database, so it's all searchable. And um, this way, if you're dealing with multiple binaries, um, you have one place to organize it. 
Again, anytime um, I'm an Android user, so when I was looking at the mobile apps, everything was within the Android space. Um, APK tool is going to be a very slick tool that can decompile the APK to its original form, let you see the source code, make some changes, and then roll it back up into an application you can then push to your phone. Um, one of the interesting things in my very basic, because I'm not an Android developer at all, uh, was what's known as the Android Manifest.xml. So if you're pulling off this application and you're curious on what security features it's actually taking from your phone when it gets installed, this file is going to have all the services that it needs to interact with Android from an API perspective. Um, so I found that very interesting in just taking a look at these apps and going, all right, what's this IoT app actually need and what's it actually requesting of my device? And again, the universal radio hacker um, interfaces with most of the SDR platforms, especially the uh, RTL SDR, which we'll discuss in a bit. Um, you can capture, replay, et cetera, blindly without even analyzing. Um, so one of the first projects I did with this was capture the car key, replay the car key, and we know about the rolling codes within the fobs, but just working on that capture and replay within this tool was pretty useful. So again, putting it all together for under 100 bucks if you're interested in IoT and kind of where to start from a research perspective. Um, from a hardware, um, Arduino Nano. So when we talked about pulling the physical uh, firmware off the devices, you can use the Nano with a little bit of soldering and some code to test for JTAG pins and actually know what ports are what within the board and actually extract that firmware. Um, RTL SDR, again, 20 bucks. This is going to receive only, so if you're looking to send within your research, you're going to have to up your, your budget. Um, but if you're simply just looking to capture some stuff and see how things work, it's $20. A uh, very cool project that I did with that is setting it up to monitor aviation. So I live right by uh, Trenton Airport. So I was able to set this up and you see the flights coming in and they're mapped on the Google map. A very interesting uh, project. Uh, so project number one, again, trying to stay within budget, you want to learn how to capture signals. Uh, this is a simple smart light that's, you know, it's not wireless or anything to the extent of uh, Z-Wave or Zigbee, but this is a simple wireless protocol that you can sniff. Again, the device is 10 bucks, um, but it's meant for just turning the outlet on and off, for example, the Christmas tree. So if you're just looking to capture, um, look up its FCC ID and know what are some of the schematics of this uh, device, um, this is a good place to start. Um, project number two, maybe the uh, Raspberry Pi is out of your price point, but you need a, a, a small computer to run all this hardware. I present to you the Pogo plug. Uh, this was designed as a, a Western digital kind of my cloud, but that, that got discontinued. Uh, but with a little Googling and some uh, Linux, you can flash this device to run uh, Arch. Arch ARM runs uh, beautiful on this device. So for $10, you now have you know your quote unquote Raspberry Pi or microcontroller. Uh, so from a demo standpoint, always mention Murphy's Law before I jump into any demo. Um, first thing we'll take a look at, and how am I on time? Yeah, perfect on time. Is we'll take a look at that Zap device, so that little home wireless um, outlet for your Christmas tree. And here's where the real does this work or not. I may have to skip this demo, as you can see my interface is a little flustered, but we should be good. So we'll start a new project, and we'll just call it FOB, and now we're going to record a signal. Choose a HackRF. Um, and finding the frequency of this device, you would look at the back of the, uh, the outlet piece. Every device that wants to talk wirelessly has to register with the FCC and have an FCC ID. You can then look that up on the internet and you'll find out what frequency uh, this device operates on. So we click record and now we have a quick capture of what is simply the on of this device. And we then save it. And if we close this, we're now going to be in the position to actually analyze it. So we can go in and, and here's where you would choose your modulation. Um, it can auto detect, but even in second guessing yourself, if we take a look at the signal, that's no, not going to work. There we go. I don't need that anymore. 
we can see some sort of um, frequency. So we have one small part of the signal, and then it speeds up, and then one small, and then it speeds up. Um, and then within this tool, you're also able to go right into the, the analysis of it, where you can start, if you had multiple recordings, just mark the differences within this capture to kind of see what's the preamble, what's the sync, what was maybe that value we're changing on or off, etc. cetera. Um, so very useful. And then again, to the generator, you can do a blind replay to see if this device has any sort of checksum to know if this is a repeated signal, etc. Or can I capture the unlock once and kind of I'm golden. Um, next device um, is a very simple RFID reader. So this is called the Proxmark. So this is what, when we talked about um, interacting with that physical security system, this is what was used to make our own fob and the facility code of it is, etc. So. Where we have and it's usually dev TTY once again hands here. So now we're gonna low frequency HID read. So now we just told the Proxmark to listen for you know your generic key fobs. So now we have that captured. Um, Facility code, for anyone that's uh, unfamiliar with RFID, the reason you have a facility code and then a unique number of the FOB is imagine you want to use the FOB across multiple facilities. So you could program certain facilities to use certain codes, and then you could use the FOB across multiple um, places. So again, one of the things I like to just speak on is IoT's everywhere. So you got to have that hacker mindset. So I was a Chuck E. Cheese. My kid's a huge skee-ball fan. And I had Chuck E. Cheese moved towards, I came in with my whole pocket full of the coins from last week, and they're like, we don't take those. Here's a card. And I was like, oh, so what kind of card's this? So if we wanted to just search within the high frequency spectrum within this, uh, we'd be able to identify, uh, if I could type, what type of card this was without any knowledge of it. And then we could start to go down the rabbit hole of what type of encryption could it be using. Um, is, it, is it as simple as this, where we could just clone it and have a copy? Uh, this is actually a pretty good key file from a security standpoint, so kudos to Chucky. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the, where are we at on time? All right, so we have time for, we can fit w one more demo in? Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, firmware. I showed a picture of the uh, outlet sync, whether or not, um, or what the outlet was doing when it, it jumped on. we see. So we know if we extract this firmware that we're going to get a uh, Linux file system that we'll be able to explore and take a look at. So now we're in now we're in the Linux file system of this firmware. So one of the first things I tend to do when looking at firmware and, and going back to the OWASP top 10 is that um, hard-coded passwords. So a quick grep for Telnet, and we see within the system all the different scripts um, that have Telnet in it, or at least the word Telnet. Uh, one of the first things that comes to mind, and what I notice, is this Etsy script miscellaneous Telnet. So that looks like it's going to start a Telnet service for this IoT device. Um, I could also see an option for login and, and the word image sign. So let's take a look at uh, the Etsy scripts miscellaneous, and let's cat uh, the Telnet. So now this is the Telnet script that's going to initiate upon this router being booted. Um, and if we look here over this part of the screen, we'll see that the login is this username, and then it's looking for the variable of image sign, which we identified earlier uh, when we took a look at the strings of that file. And if you can see, image sign is simply a cat of Etsy config image sign. So if you go back within the directory, 
Oh. Right. It's not. Oh, excuse me. Let's see. There it is. Long story short, I can't see the other end of the screen. It's a hard-coded password within this firmware. So that would be the process of using some simple tools, just as hex dump, um, grep, strings, all the ones that we were told not to use in the last presentation, um, <laughs> to basically look at this firmware from a um, hands-on perspective and to see, again, is there any hard-coded passwords. Um, that's basically everything I had from a demo perspective, you know, given you know, some of the Murphy's Law that I love mentioning for that reason. Um, but then again, just thank you, questions and answers. And again, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be at B-Sides. Anybody have any questions? I just had something to say going along with uh, what you said about Android apps. So if you're not really uh, like into Android apps too much, right, there is a, a tool on GitHub called Quark, Q-A-R-K, okay. that will pull the app and show you the vulnerabilities in less than two minutes. So it's like a vulnerability scanner for Android apps? Yep. It okay. makes your job a little That's bit easier. That's why I love coming to these things. <laughs> so from a security standpoint, um, do you recommend using something like a ZigBee or Z-Wave protocol over something like um, MQTT over traditional Wi-Fi? I mean, to that point, it's still, it all comes down to the implementation. I think the, the protocol has methods of being secure. They've rewritten and they fixed some things, but it really comes down to engineering side implementation of what that device is actually doing. Uh, back to that network and link key, that's not something that's built into the protocol, so sometimes how you implement and get that across can be the vulnerability. Um, so either way, regardless of what spectrum, the protocol and the method of transferring the data stays the same. So the vulnerability, to your point, is going to exist whether it's direct or over the Wi-Fi. Any other questions? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Going twice. All right. Uh, thank you guys all for attending. Uh, please give Charles a nice round of applause.